Good evening, everyone, or at least I believe it will be evening whenever you're watching this video. As you can see from the window behind me, it's not evening at the time of this recording, but due to the wonders of technology, here we are. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Schwant. I'm the Associate Rector and Youth Pastor at St. Timothy's Anglican Church. I was supposed to be joining you in person this weekend. Unfortunately, I got exposed to COVID this last week and due to Camp Lone Star's health and safety regulations and my own good conscience, I couldn't be with you in person. But again, due to the wonders of technology, here we are. Today, or tonight, excuse me, we are going to be in Luke chapter 8. We're going to be in verses 26 through 39. So if you have your Bible, open your Bible up to Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Again, that's Luke 8, 26 through 39. I believe you should have gotten some journals or some pamphlets that maybe will have some note sections, some note-taking sections in it for the sermon. If you want to take notes, I encourage you to do so. Now would be a good time to get that out, get your pen ready as we are getting prepared to dive in to this passage of Scripture. But before we do that, now as we get our Bibles and our journals and our pens and get ready to meditate on the Word of God, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity. Lord, what a wonderful joy it is that even um, through time and space, through the gift of technology that you've given us, we're still able to hear your Word and your message for us here today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this weekend. Thank you for who you are and the gift of your Son. I pray uh, pr a prayer for each and every person that is at this retreat right now, Heavenly Father. I pray a prayer of protection. I pray your Spirit can come in a mighty way, Heavenly Father, in each and every one of their lives. That lives will be changed and lives will be transformed and your Spirit will come and fill them in a mighty way. Lord Jesus, we love you. We love you, we love you, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He, had, he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it to the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to see Jesus and found the man whom the, the demons had gone sitting at his feet, and sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it told how the demon-possessed man had come to be healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart with them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. This weekend's theme is unexpected Jesus. And we are looking how Jesus continually acts in an unexpected way. Unexpected when you compare it to how he was expected to act, and how the Jews expected him to act, and how the world expected him to act. And in fact, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven continues to do the unexpected when it is compared to the world and the world around you, the world around us. And we're going to look at how Jesus does that yet again in this story here tonight. Luke chapter 8, again, verses 26 through 33. And there's three things that I want us to look at. 
three things that I want us to keep in mind that Jesus does. Jesus loves those whom we least expect. Jesus' plan is often what we do not expect. And Jesus uses people that we often do not expect. If it looks like I'm looking off screen, it's because I am. My notes are, in fact, on the screen next to the one I'm looking at. So don't get weird about that. Again, Jesus loves those whom we least expect. Jesus' plan is often those who we do not expect. And Jesus uses people that we often do not expect. Let's jump in. Let's just walk through this verse and see what sort of message Jesus has for us today. One of the first things that we need to keep in mind, and you kind of have to read in between the lines in order to get this from this passage is that Jesus actually goes to a Gentile town. The Gerasenes was across the Galilean Sea. It would have been a Gentile town. We know it was most like, likely a Gentile town because archaeological evidence tells us that it was mainly Gentiles who lived in that area. And also, the herd of pigs is another good example. Uh, pigs were considered unclean in Jewish culture, so it would have been very odd for a Jewish town to have a herd of pigs outside of it. They would much rather have uh, different animals like that, but pigs definitely wouldn't have been around. So this was a Gentile town that Jesus comes to. And the reason why that's a big deal is that uh, Jesus, being a good Jew, would have tried to have the least amount of contact with Gentiles possible. Now, if you don't know what a Gentile is, a Gentile is simply someone who is not a Jew. It is how the Jews looked at the world. It's how the Jews understood their world. If you were a Jew, you were a Jew. If you were not a Jew, you were a Gentile. It's basically just everybody else. Everybody else is a Gentile. You and me, unless you happen to come from some Jewish descent, are a Gentile. And Gentiles were looked down upon in the Jewish world. They were not of the people of God. They, were not, they did not have the awesome stories that you and I know of. The story of Moses and how he delivered the people from slavery, from Egypt, and King David, and King Solomon, and the prophet Isaiah, and the prophet Jeremiah, to name just a few. That the promises of God and the stories of God weren't their stories. God had plucked them out, and so that made them special. And so everybody else wasn't as important, wasn't as special as the Jewish people. And the promises of God, they thought applied strictly to Jews. They believed that the Messiah, when he came, would be this military conquering hero that would establish a literal kingdom on earth. Again, a kingdom of heaven on earth, you know, like a, like a, like King David was, and it would reign for forever. That's what they expected. That's what they were looking for. So Jesus, like from the get-go, is acting in an unexpected way. He's born in a manger. He's this carpenter some sort of hard laborer, you know, he, he's a rabbi, but he doesn't have any really rabbinic training, and he has this ragtag group of disciples that follow him around. He's constantly challenging the authorities. So he's already acting in an unexpected way, even before this story, and he acts in an even more unexpected way whenever he goes to a Gentile town. And again, the reason why this is important is it models for us is that Jesus was willing to go to the people that he was least expected to go to. The people that were the social pariahs in the circle that he ran around in, the Gentiles, certainly wouldn't go associate with the Gentiles. And yet here we have a story of Jesus going and loving and serving a Gentile town. It teaches us that we should be going and loving and serving the people in our own circles that make us uncomfortable. Luke takes it a step further, and we're introduced to this uh, person who has been uh, demon-possessed. Biblical scholars like to throw around the term demoniac and makes us feel good using big, long, fancy words. But it's just the man who has been possessed by these demons, and the picture that Luke paints for us is of this man who is like objectively broken, who is objectively lost, right? It's this guy who runs around naked, lives in the graveyard amongst the tombs amongst the dead people, and the townspeople had like tried to chain him down, and they, but the demons gave him this like supernatural strength, and he's like, ah, no, you can't contend me, and 
he goes and runs off in the desert, and I can just imagine, like, the conversations that the townspeople might go. It's like, oh, well, there's the guy. He's running around in the desert. He's naked again. Oh, goodness, maybe we should try to chain him up, but it didn't go well last time. Oh, what are we going to do? It's the first guy that they meet upon reaching this Gentile town, and you can imagine the conversations that the good Jewish people that follow Jesus to this crazy mission that he's undertaking is like, oh, Jesus, serves you right. We come to this Gentile town. What's the first person we meet? This guy, this demon-possessed, crazy naked man, is a great first foot forward, you know? And what Luke is painting for us is, is this assumption of this powerful demon, this absolutely powerful demon, possessed man, gives him supernatural strength, is absolutely subservient to Jesus. But there's also this other underlying thought of acknowledging how powerful this demon is and acknowledging how broken this man is, is if there's anyone whose love Jesus wouldn't be able to reach, it would be this man. If there's anybody whose love, if Jesus' love wouldn't be able to penetrate those layers and layers of demons that are possessing him, it wouldn't be this man. And yet, what does Jesus show us? His love is stronger than any force of darkness, and his love can reach anyone. This man would be the person that you would least expect Jesus to go to. The Jews at his time and the religious leaders at this time would have expected Jesus to go and talk to the religious leaders, to maybe the town elder, the town mayor. Certainly, if you can get the, the leader of the town on board, then the other people will follow your great message. You certainly, your first person is not going to be this guy, the crazy naked man who's running around at the graveyard. And yet Jesus shows us time and time again how he loved those whom we least expect him to. And as we go forward in our own lives, we need to model that same love. Going forward, continuing on with the story, Jesus' plan is often what we do not expect, and Jesus uses the people that we often do not expect. These next two points kind of come together, so buckle up. The story we have here is the story of Jesus heals the man. And again, we have the story of the pigs, and that's one of the big clues how we know it was a Gentile town, because there are pigs there. They go into the pigs, all the demons, and then the pigs drown themselves. It's this dramatic. And the herdsmen who had been watching this were like, ah, what happened? And the pigs run into the water. The herdsmen go back to town. And they start telling people what had happened. And they came out. And they see old Mr. Naked, crazy, demon-possessed man. He's clothed in his right mind and sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning all he can from him. It's such a change of where he was. It's such a change that the people are so surprised that by this, they reject it. They reject Jesus. They say, you know, Jesus, you came, you're starting to rock the boat. I don't know what's going on. The pigs are dead. The man's okay. This is a lot to take in. You know, I think it would just be better if you just left. If you just went, go on with your life back to where you were before you came here. Is how I imagine maybe the people received what had happened. How often in our own lives, maybe whenever we begin to preach the gospel and whenever we begin to do the good work that Jesus has called us to do, that we are presented with our own challenges. How Jesus met challenges from this town. Sometimes whenever we begin to preach the gospel, people begin to make fun of us. Or we begin to feel uncomfortable. And how, oh, I don't want to talk about that. It's awkward. I don't want to do that. How much hope it must bring us, brings me, to know that Jesus as well ran into opposition to his ministry. If Jesus, who is God and perfect, ran into opposition and still continued to do the work, how much more must we continue to do the work whenever we run into opposition? Going forward, we have this image of Jesus is leaving, which is unexpected. You would expect Jesus to stick it out. You would expect if anybody was going to stick it out, it would be Jesus, you know. Jesus is presented as this figure time and time again who's kind of like willing to pick a fight, you know. 
the Gospel of John starts, and he has the cat of nine tails, and he's flipping tables, and he's storming through the temple, and he's like, ah, my den of thieves and robbers! You've turned my house, my father's house into, what is going on? And then there's the Pharisees, and how often does Jesus pick a fight with the Pharisees, right? So you would expect if there's anybody who's going to be like, no, I'm going to stay because you people need to hear this, it's going to be Jesus. But what does he do? He leaves. And we're left wondering, what is Jesus doing? What is going on? What is Jesus' plan? This is not like the Jesus that we've met so far. What is going on? What is happening? We continue on. We continue on to see Jesus do something again unexpected. This man, this demon-possessed man, whom Jesus had just saved, says, Hey, Jesus, can I follow you? Seems like a reasonable request. We are told to, called to follow Jesus. We're told to follow Jesus. It would make sense to, for Jesus to have this man as kind of like a PR guy, you know, like, hey, there's an example of all the great things I do, follow me. You know, he used to be possessed by demons. Oh, yeah, he used to be possessed by demons. It was great. You can imagine the conversation and the sales pitch going forward. We go on and on. We hear and we see Jesus says no. He says no, you can't follow me. You have to go back. And sometimes this is really hard, because God will tell us no. I wish I could sit here and tell you that God was just this like magical slot machine that you could pull the lever and like whatever you wanted would pop up, but no, that's not how God operates. God often says no to us. You know, my daughter Margaret is just about to turn two years old, and one of her favorite things to do in the world is to watch her show. She says, show, 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 constantly. But if we let Margaret watch her shows day in and day out, how much of life would she miss out on? She wouldn't be able to hug her brother like she likes to. She wouldn't be able to play outside or go on walks or go hang out with friends like she wants to if she just sat in front of her show. So sometimes we have to tell her no because we have a better plan in store for her. How often does God sometimes tell us no because he has a better plan for us in store? Sometimes he tells us no because what we're doing is bad for us. How would that mess up Margaret's development if we just let her watch shows all the time? What sort of person would she grow up into? I don't even want to begin to imagine that. But sometimes the no that God tells us is for our own good and sometimes can lead us into a better place. And here we have exactly that. With this demon-possessed man who had been liberated from this demon, he's told to go back to this town, this town that had just rejected Jesus. Jesus prepares a way for them to still hear the gospel, to still hear the work that Jesus had done in this man's life and to proclaim the goodness of God and to proclaim the goodness of Jesus. Jesus prepares a way for this town to hear the gospel. And he uses this man who just moments ago had been naked, had been living in the graveyard, had been possessed by who knows how many demons. And yet Jesus uses him to proclaim the gospel. And this is so totally like Jesus. This is so totally like the God that we know, right? How many times have we met people that we would not expect God to use? Moses is a great example. Moses was a stutterer. He was slow of speech. You would not expect him to lead the people of Israel out of slavery. He was a murderer, for God's sake. He was a murderer. And yet God used him for his good plan. Saul, who turned into Paul, whenever he was Saul tried to kill as many Christians as he could get his hands on. And yet God turned him into one of the greatest evangelists of all time. And you have Peter, Peter who rejected Jesus three times in a row whenever Jesus needed his friends the most. And yet God plucked him out and made him one of the chief leaders of the early church. God's loves to use, God loves to use those whom we least expect him to use. So if you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, oh, I, God can't use me. God can't use me, not me. I'm too broken. 
I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't know enough. I don't have any friends. I don't know anybody that's not a Christian. I want you to listen to the story and the stories throughout the scriptures and hear that God loves to use people whom you would least expect him to use. And that includes you. God wants to use you. He wants to use you to bring his love of his kingdom to everyone around you. And through it, change your life. Jesus loves those whom we least expect. Jesus' plan is often what we do not expect. And Jesus uses people. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these kids and these adult leaders here. Lord Jesus, I pray that you can come in a mighty way in their lives right now. I pray that you can give them visions of faces, visions of people, visions of the people that you are calling them to love and to preach to right now. That you can bring to their minds their friends at school, the people that they work with, they may see them in the grocery store or around the park or in the hallway. And I pray that you can convict their heart and give them your desire for that person to be brought into your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you can give them confidence to preach your kingdom, to preach your gospel for your kingdom. Lord Jesus, we know that you are good and that you are God and that you have a plan for us, even if it is something unexpected. And I pray that you can continue to grow in us the faith to follow after you and after that plan, as unexpected as it may be. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you.